Good evening, everyone. I think they're wanting me to start, so I just want to I have a few announcements to tell everybody. The main announcement for tonight is that we need somebody to prepare communion for October. Nobody's signed up on the list yet. So if you enjoy taking communion and you want something to do to serve the church that's not standing up here speaking, that's a good opportunity for you to serve. Um, I also want to remind everybody that the outreach for this month is for Pinevale Children's Home. If you look in your bulletins, there's a list of of things to bring for them, including pre-sweetened cereal and Lysol wipes and body wash that's not strongly scented, some stuff like that. Uh, they would love to have that, I'm sure. We also need to remember those in our community with COVID. Ann Adkins was telling me about her neighbor that has COVID, so we just need to pray for the people in our community and remember it and be aware of it and pray for those people. So let's start off tonight with a prayer. Lord, we come before you tonight. We're so thankful that, that we can gather together as your people to encourage one another, to learn more about your word, and to sing praises to your name. Father, we thank you for watching over us and taking care of us. We do ask you to be with the people with COVID, and we ask you to heal them. We ask you to be with all the rest of the people on our prayer list, Lord. We pray that you would Give them strength and encouragement. And help them to get past whatever their ailments are at the moment, Lord. Lord, we pray for our community in general. We ask that you bless them, help us to be a light to them, and help us to show them your love in all that we do. We just pray that they'll be have their eyes open to see it, Lord. Lord, we ask that you be with us tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, we begin by saying God is love. Let's all stand and sing. Let every heart rejoice and sing.
title of tonight's sermon is Pass It On, A Challenge to Grandparents. And the scripture reading is Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God has given you for all time. Good evening to you gathered here as well as those joining us at home or elsewhere and we're glad that you're here with us. Out on the table in the foyer you'll find our three blanks. I'm out of practice on blanks. Can you believe I just have three items? But anyway I put a word search in there for you also if you're if you like to do those then you will find words from tonight's lesson that you're looking for in the word search. I'm reading to you in just a moment from Genesis chapter 5 and I would urge you to turn there and be ready to follow along. This is Grandparents Day. Some of you have had school activities, perhaps, with your grandchildren. Or in some way you've recognized that or encouraged your children to be in connection with their grandparents. But it all began with a lady by the name of Marion McQuaid and her husband Joe, who were residents of Fayette County, West Virginia, a generation ago. And they were the parents, get this now, of 15 children and great-grandparents of 40 and great-grandparents of eight. No wonder they were thinking about grandparents, right? But in 1973, after a five-year campaign, Mrs. McQuaid pushed legislation that Congress passed proclaiming the first Sunday after Labor Day is National Grandparents Day. And September was chosen to honor grandparents because it brought to mind the autumn years of life. And President Jimmy Carter signed the proclamation. In Genesis chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, the Bible reads, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. Now let me stop for a moment. And as we read through all of these begots, notice please how the generations overlap. People in this time lived for hundreds of years quite often. And so you might have had in one small area, because people, if you've ever studied the culture of Bible times, in this particular time, in Abraham's time, for example, we'll just use him as an example, people were clannish. They traveled in large groups for safety and practicality and they settled in large groups as members of a family. And so it would be possible with people living hundreds and hundreds of years, in fact it was more than possible, it was a reality that your grandparents would still be alive, your great-grandparents would still be alive, your great-great-grandparents would still be alive, and maybe another grade or two for these names that we're reading. Anyway, back to Genesis 5 and verse 22. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch 
were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all of the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And maybe that's enough to make the point that there was a large family influence available to people that were born in this time, and I don't have to remind us that we have a much shorter time of direct family influence available to our young children today. But one thing in common of all these people, no matter if they live 700, 800, 900, or more years, they did something with their life. In this case, the phrase is, they begot sons and daughters, and then, and he died. The sand is running out of the hourglass for those of us who are older. The way that we were raised, no matter our age, as we grow up, we may choose to replicate that in the way that we do our family business, or we may not. We may keep some of it and discard the rest, and that's well and good. In today's age, families sometimes, because of college educations and uh, a conglomerate of people from all over the place coming together after high school, a lot of times families are separated all across our nation and even around the world. But in Genesis chapter 5, when we see the importance and the potential of grandparental influence, though the years of time have shortened that we may have that potential influence. Those of us who are grandparents or grandparental figures, that's a phrase I want to throw out because I didn't grow up thinking about that phrase. But as I look back on my life, I had a lot of grandparental figures in my life. I could start naming them and I would run out of fingers and toes in a, in a hurry. And I suspect with you, though you may not have thought about it in a while, that you're in the same particular situation. And I would encourage those of us who have reared our children to be adults that we not only look after our own blood kin grandchildren but maybe it's because of distance maybe it's because of 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 time but we have an opportunity to be grandparental figures just like teachers and other uh, educational personnel are in loco parentis in the place of parents in our school system. We can stand in the place of grandparents for those whose grandparents have passed on. The most valuable book that I have in my house, and in fact, one of the most valuable items in my house, and I know that because if the house was on fire, once I made sure that it was empty of people, if I had time, I would grab 
the family Bible, the study Bible, that goes back to the 1850s of my great-grandfathers. And I have it in a glass case with a lock on it, not a lock to keep people out, but just a lock to keep the dust and the deterioration down to a minimum. And it's uh, the, the most valuable printed material that I know of in my home. It is irreplaceable to me. And I wonder when my great-grandfather lived in the Pine Knot community in Northeast Arkansas back in the 1850s and when he hooked the team up to drive every day to uh, worship and then when they finished their morning worship, they would spread a lunch together and then would have an afternoon, early afternoon service because it was a full day's job just to get the team ready and then drive that wagon and team several miles to church, as we would say. I wonder if he ever had a thought about me. Well, whether he did or whether he didn't, he has been a great influence in my life. And I hope that you are being a great influence in the lives of your grandchildren and in those children that you have somewhat adopted as grandparental figures. In Genesis chapter five, we get an account of a man named Enoch. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. And the Bible says Enoch walked close to or with God. But what does the Bible tell us about Noah? In Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, it says, in contrast to where the, the thought of people's heart was only evil continually, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Now look at this phrase and see if it sounds familiar. Noah walked with God. So Enoch walked with God and so did his great grandson Noah. And grandparents, I wonder if we think that our faith or lack thereof will affect future generations. We don't just do what we do to have influence on the time in which we live. But the guidance that we give, the provisions that we make, particularly for the spiritual education of our young people, will be paying dividends when we've been in the grave for a hundred years. Are we living a life like Enoch's? Listen to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And so when we talk about Noah, when we talk about his, his kin, several generations removed, number one, Noah was a righteous man in a totally corrupt world. And other than Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, where it says that Noah walked with God, there's another great testimony to the quality of Noah's life in Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, where my Bible reads, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread 
send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. God said in the, in, in the, in the future and the summation of the scope of faithfulness to me, that times may get so bad, the land may be inhabited by people so worldly minded that even if Noah and Daniel and Job moved right into the middle of it geographically, they wouldn't be able to save a single soul but their own. And so this is our job as grandparents, first of all, to see that we ourselves are right with God. When you get on an airliner and the instructions are given, we know those pre-flight instructions by heart just about it. At least we can give you an accurate summary of them. And the main lesson seems to be to know how to get out of here, closest to where you're sitting, and to remember that in the event of some kind of loss of oxygen, that mask will drop from the ceiling and it says, first secure your own mask, First, secure your own seat belt. First, secure your own exit. Look after yourself, and then you'll be better able to help those around you who need your assistance. And it's the same way with our spiritual business. It was not easy for Noah to be a righteous person. In Genesis 6, I'll go on and read 5 through 7 that I alluded to a moment ago. The Bible says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. You know, the Bible doesn't say that God was sorry about any other part of his creation. Except that man degenerated to the point, those men and women did, that God regretted their creation. And that sounds like the way that things are today. And you know, it would be easy for us as grandparents to become discouraged. It would be easy to be like all the rest. It's not easy to be like Enoch and Noah, but God calls us to live right and to provide the example of the Christian experience over a long period of time. But even if we don't see anyone in our family saved but ourselves, let's make sure that we ourselves are saved. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 and following, my Bible reads, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Watch it now. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We talk about we can become a child of God. We are the family of God. Here the phrase is, we are sons and daughters of God. The question has to come back to us, what kind of a family member are we? Point number two, Noah followed God's instructions exactly. God did not leave us without a book of instructions. 
And our Bible is there not just to be read, but it's there to be studied, and not just to be read and studied, but read, studied, and lived. And it is just as critical this evening that we live the words of God's book as it was for Noah to follow the instructions that God gave him in such detail once upon a time. In Genesis 6, beginning in verse 14, Noah was told, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Have you ever thought about that? That make yourself part. To me that says, even if Mrs. Noah doesn't go with you, you do this. Even if your sons do not join you and Mrs. Noah, you do this. Even if your daughters-in-law do not join their husbands who join Mrs. Noah and you, if it's just you, you do this. And a lot of people have my respect in this congregation, but particularly the ones that have my respect in this congregation are those who week after week after week after year after year after year, they come and they worship God as far as their family is concerned alone. And they live the Christian life as far as their family is concerned practically or maybe literally alone. Well, you're in good company. Did Noah build the ark the way he wanted to? No. He followed God's instructions exactly as given, and that's the only reason this story has a happy ending and the only reason that we're here. Genesis 6 and verse 22 says, Thus Noah did according to all, and that's an important word, that God commanded him, so he did. I believe if Noah had doubted God's wisdom or chose to build the ark his way, it would not have floated. Or if it floated, it would have temporarily so floated and then sunk. But all would have been lost. All his sons would have died. And Noah's son, Shem, would have drowned in the flood. Somebody said, so what about Shem? Shem is important. In Genesis 11 and verse 10, the Bible says this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. Somebody said, you still hadn't told me why Shem was important. So his child was Arphaxad two years after the flood. Who was Arphaxad? Well, it was Noah's grandson. Somebody said, so what? Genesis 11 and verse 12 and following tells us that our facts said was Noah's grandson, the great, 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 I think I've got all my greats in there, grandfather of Abraham. So no Shem, no Abraham. Now listen to Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Folks, it is obvious that the kind of faith Noah had made it possible for him to obey God even in times when it was hard to do so. And we do not know what our future will look like in this nation. 
Freedoms that we have taken for granted all our lives may be in jeopardy. History that we who are older have studied a long time ago, this history is being disregarded and even written out of our textbooks. And we have a faith that has been passed down through generations, but at some point that, in, that inherited faith must become our own. And that same faith that made it possible for Abraham to obey God when he told him to leave his home made it possible that when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, Hebrews 11 and verse 17, indicates that Abraham obeyed God even when it didn't seem logical. So the whole point of tonight's lesson, if you want to get to the point on Grandparents Day 2021 is that we are studying a man who followed the example set by his grandparents. And that's why this lesson is entitled, Pass It On. Do you see the importance of passing on our faith? If the littles, the little ones, see us obeying God without question, it has to make an impression on them. And that gets to point number three, and that is Noah totally submitted his life to God. Noah endured ridicule, not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, but what we would consider a long lifetime, our time, in building the ark and in preaching to people, and he didn't have much of a record of any response in a positive way to what he was preaching. But he put his trust in God, even though the world had never seen it rain before the flood. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, it says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So Noah's supposed to build this gigantic boat where there was no water and in fact when there had never been any rain, much less a flood. And Noah trusted God to help him build that ark just like we must trust God. It's the only sensible alternative that we must trust God to build the kind of family of which we can be proud in the meanwhile and then when this life is over we can be reunited for an eternity together. And not only did Noah have help in building that ark, he also trusted God to bring to the ark all those animals. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 15, the Bible says they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So Noah didn't have to become a zookeeper in the sense of going out and rounding up all these animals on safari, but God brought them to the ark and they went in to Noah and verse 16 of Genesis 7 says, so those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. So what does all this mean? Do your grandchildren see you acting like Noah? Are you influencing your grandchildren to be faithful, obedient, respectful, responsible? Are you fun to be with are you communicating with your grandchildren in a positive way? Or do we just communicate from afar? Or are we spoiling them rotten and then sending them home? 
I scribbled down some things that grandparents can provide for their grandchildren. You know, we're always wanting ideas around our house. Well, what would so-and-so like for his or her Christmas present this year? Well, I can give you some ideas of some things you can provide for your grandchildren that'll turn out to be very valuable decisions, such things as teach them about God and their spiritual business. Guide them into a good marriage by modeling a good one. Don't have bad habits that you don't want them to have. Be consistent and follow through on things you say you will do. Play with them. Get out on the floor with them. It may take two or three people to get you up, but it'll be worth getting down into the floor and just having a good old time. Those are the sort of things that we remember as we grow older that our grandparents did with us. Often tell them that you love them. Look for the good things in your grandkids and not just the bad. Don't pressure them too much to excel. Believe them and believe in them. And most importantly, point them towards heaven as your time on earth is likely shorter than theirs. Did you know that someone turns 50 years of age, five zero, every six seconds? Did you know that people over the age of 50 account for 43% of all U.S. households? The over 85 age group, 85 now and up, is the fastest growing segment of the population. And the number of citizens older than 85 will double by the year 2030. The U.S. population aged 65 plus is expected to double in size within the next 25 years. Life expectancy, if we could transport ourselves back to 1900, would have been about 46 years. And today we've added 30 years or so to that. Folks, we live in a culture that promotes youthfulness and denies the importance of the elderly. We're in a congregation that is gaining more and more older Christians. And the age gap must not become a fellowship gap. The age gap must not become a detriment. But surely we can see the wisdom in taking advantage of the life experience of those who have been through a lot of the similar things that we'll wrestle with. We who are younger can look around and everybody except Mr. Potter can find somebody that's younger than you, or older than you. We have in Leviticus 19 and verse 32 an admonition that is not a suggestion, it's a command. And I believe in principle it is stated in the New Testament. And it says, you shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. Some listening to me may not have their spiritual business in order. Oh, you may have been to your financial advisor and to your CPA and to your estate attorney and you may have provided for the physical needs of your family with some kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of a gift after you're dead and gone, but how have we provided for our spiritual legacy? And I would urge you to think about your opportunity as well as your responsibility to pass your faith on to others.
2,000 years ago, those who believed in the Lord, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Jesus, and were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, their sins, and the Bible said that they all were together and had all things common. Though, have you ever thought about how many different ages there may have been there as the church began on earth in Acts chapter 2? And may it be said of the West Main Church, my, how they have passed their faith along. As we stand and sing, if we can help you in any way, we invite you to come. to complete or take the communion to complete your worship for today you may exit out the back of the auditorium take a left down the hallway to the library um, as we sing our closing song abide with me <clears throat> Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us, and we're so thankful that we can freely gather together here. We especially thank you for grandparents, uh, those that are good examples and good influences on children, and help all of us to be people that point children toward heaven. We ask that you bless our elders, be with them in our spiritual decisions regarding our congregation's uh, present and future activities. We thank you so much for our minister, Carrie Williams, be with him and 
We thank you so much for our super qualified substitute, Doug Greenway, and the good job that he's able to do on occasions uh, here now. We thank you for our deacons. We ask that you would be with them in the activities and programs that they help lead uh, for our congregation. We thank you so much for our teachers, those that teach our young ones and also help point the children toward heaven. Be with our national and state and local leaders as they provide for our country's defense and for our local safety. Uh, give them enough wisdom that they're wise enough to look to the Bible for guidance. We ask that you be with our congregation's sick and shut-ins and be especially with those that have had surgery that they would have successful recovery from those surgeries. Help us to be Christians and Christian examples each day of the week, not just Sunday only believers. Be with each of us. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.